Let me take you back to a simpler time and tell you the story about two best friends. Their names were Vax and Unix. Vax was a simple country computer with one CPU, one DRAM, one virtual and one physical address space. Unix was Vax's very best friend and took care of everything. This wasn't hard. Unix just had to grab a bit of CPU time and all the address spaces. And when we started running two processes at once, Unix could just program the MMU to build a virtual CPU for each from separate RAM areas. This all worked well for a long time and things stayed nice and simple. Sure, there were a few things that didn't quite fit the model, like a disk device. The disk controller still looked enough like RAM though, and Unix just managed that itself too. This let Unix actually play some clever tricks. Disk blocks could be read into Unix's own memory and cached. Unix could then give them straight to processes without copying them, just by sharing its RAM. Thus, the MAP syscall was born, and all was well. Though, as Vax and Unix grew up, they grew apart. Vax and his friends changed, but Unix always stayed Unix. Vax moved to the city and started experimenting with buses, and then caches, and devices, and even joined an SMP gang. Soon, one bus wasn't enough anymore for Vax and his new friends. They needed more. Some got into NUMA, others tried DMA or virtualization. There were even some unfortunate few who ended up wasting away in coprocessor houses, totally reliant on GPUs just to get through an ordinary workload. Unix couldn't even recognize his old friend anymore. There were others in his hardware body's life now, and he didn't know where he fit in. Unix wasn't even sure where the physical address was anymore, and suspected that the hardware didn't either. This story ends as these stories always do. One of Unix's second cousins, Android Linux, found itself working with a distant relative of Wax inside a mobile phone chipset. This hardware was pretty deeply into asymmetric coprocessing and had been taking closed binary blobs. This worried Linux, but the DSP played it down. It's totally safe, man. I've got SMMUs and everything. It'll never happen. The DSP seemed cool and Linux was pretty trusting, so went along with it. Then, wouldn't you know it, but the DSP got itself infected by a malicious Wi-Fi packet. Linux wasn't worried though, the SMMU would protect it. The DSP needed a packet buffer, nothing unusual, and hey, even if the DSP is compromised, it'll only hurt the client, for Linux. It wasn't until later that Linux realized the DSP hadn't just asked for a packet buffer, but for a mapping to all of RAM, which disabled the SMMU. Linux had been owned. Linux swore i never trust a smart device again, but still had to work with them. What was it going to do? So what went wrong? Let's break it down. This doesn't look like the systems for which Unix was designed, like Vax. Most importantly, there are one, mutually distrusting components, Android Linux and vendor firmware. Two, multiple virtual and physical address spaces managed by different components. This is only a fraction of the chip, but enough to show the problem. Let's grab a little more space. That's better. Here are the address spaces too virtual and too physical. Labeling some virtual and others physical is arbitrary and doesn't reflect anything meaningful, so we don't. An address space is just a set of addresses, names, which may contain resources called accepting regions or mappings to segments of other address spaces. For example, the DSP needs a mapping to its own control registers. The CPU has implicit access to the whole system address space. The DS DSP's virtual space is neither controlled by nor visible to Linux, so we ignore it. Process address spaces are the same. Now we see what happens. The driver allocates buffers with the Linux API, for example, DMA alloc coherent, and tells the DSP core where they are. The DSP core asks the driver to map the buffer in its SMMU, and the driver obliges. Many buffers are mapped, including directly to processes. There's nothing forcing the DSP core to ask for the same range that the driver sent to it. 
the driver will happily map away its whole address space. This is a classic confused deputy. The driver has the ambient authority of the kernel and it is tricked into misusing it. What authority does the driver actually need? What does it use? It needs to modify some part of the DSP's physical address space. This is the map write. The driver must also map to processes. This isn't enough yet. The problem was that the driver mapped memory it shouldn't. It needs the write to map this particular memory somewhere. This is the grant write. The driver has the grant write for B1 and B2. Map says which address spaces you can modify and grant what you can give them. So the driver can't be tricked, every write has a secure, consistent name. A write is named by a small integer. As are address spaces. In a central table, we store the address range, which operations are allowed and importantly, which address space the write refers to. The driver starts with the map write to the DSP's physical space. DMA alloc coherent returns a grant write to the buffer. The system only refers to writes by their table index, the name. The name unambiguously identifies which portion of which address space we mean and what write we exercise. If the driver uses names consistently, it can never be tricked. A nice clean model is lovely, but pretty useless unless you can actually implement it. Can we express these ideas using the traditional language of Unix? Can we implement it efficiently without rebuilding things from the ground up? The answer is yes. We need three things. A database of address space objects with permissions. A central table of rights over these objects, indexed by unambiguous secure identifiers. A mechanism to manipulate address spaces securely, invoking rights only by their secure identifiers. If we think back to the good old days of Unix, we can see that this all already exists. The file system is a dynamic permission database, perfect for exposing the system's address spaces in a standard pseudo file system, like slash proc or slash this. There already is a central table of rights over file objects, the open file table. Inside the kernel, the secure identifier is the struct file pointer. At user level, it's the file descriptor. Finally, the invocation method is mmap whose signature we extend to include not just the source, i.e. what to map, but also the destination, where to map it. Complex networks of interacting address spaces can then be managed either in kernel or as here at user level with a small set of familiar Unix primitives. So this is how you could do it in Linux. Reviewers asked us whether we had indeed done an implementation or if this was just a proposal. Well, so the answer is yes, we did implement it, but no, it wasn't in Linux. Unix file descriptors are basically capabilities, so it's no surprise that this maps really well onto a capability-based operating system like, say, Barrelfish. And we extended Barrelfish to handle multiple address spaces in this kind of way. Actually, this was the work that we did first. However, we found it somewhat challenging to publish operating system design work like this when it wasn't implemented in Linux. Hence, this paper, delete the implementation and the evaluation sections, figure out how to map it onto the Unix file system, give it a catchy systems call name, submit it to HotOS, and voila. However, this work does actually allow us to do a comparison where we measure the cost of the extra complexity of representing all of these address spaces in the memory system. So Rito, what is the cost of this fidelity? Well, as it turns out, not much at all. So we ran the Apple and Lee benchmarks, and here are the results. With mmapx, the Barrelfish kernel needs to do additional checks, like are the source and destination capability compatible with each other. Furthermore, the mapping destination grant capability has to be created. However, you can see the overhead is negligible. Obviously, you can't just extrapolate from Barrelfish to Linux, but we see no reason why it won't be similar. After all, everything is faster on Linux anyway, right? But the, at the end of the day, you definitely need MMAPX. Otherwise, cross SOC bugs like Qualpawn are just going to keep happening. MMAPX has a rigorous and accurate model of hardware addressing mapped onto those cozy Unix abstractions 
that you all know and love.